Welcome back to the next video, everybody. Today, we are going to prove Fermat's last theorem for exponent three. We're going to do this in two parts over the course of two videos, and I'll explain what those two videos will be as we move along. Okay, so here's the theorem. Recall from last video, Fermat's last theorem. Let n at least three be an integer. Then x to the n plus y to the n equals z to the n, where x, y, z is non-zero, has no solutions over the integers. We're going to prove this for n equals three starting today. So we're going to break the proof into a series of claims. We're mostly going to go through Euler's proof, but there's a gap in Euler's proof, and we'll discuss that gap today, and we'll fill in that gap next video. So proof, n equals three, Euler, 1758 to 1770. So we're going to go by contradiction, and we're going to try to get a contradiction by infinite descent, much like we did for the exponent four case done last video. We'll assume there is a non-trivial integer solution, ABC, to the Fermat equation of exponent three written as x cubed plus y cubed equals z cubed. Again, as discussed last video, we can assume that a, b, c is primitive, meaning any two of these three numbers are co-prime, and that a, b, and c are actually positive. That was also discussed last video. We're going to proceed to find a contradiction by infinite descent. We're going to basically produce a strictly decreasing infinite sequence of positive integers. Claim one. Given a primitive non-trivial integer solution, ABC, to the Fermat equation of exponent 3, there must exist two natural numbers, K and L, such that K and L are co-prime. K and L have opposite parity. One is odd and one is even. And 2K times K squared plus 3L squared is a perfect cube. Let's prove this. First of all, note that exactly one of A, B, or C must be even. I'll let you check that. Suppose initially that C is even. I'll remark on what to do in any other case in a moment. If C is even, A and B must be odd by primitivity. Hence, A plus or minus B are even. So we can write 2K equals A plus B and 2L equals A minus B for some integers K and L. And these are going to end up being our K and L. You notice that A is one half times A plus B plus A minus B, which is K plus L. And B is one half times A plus B minus A minus B, which is K minus L. So the first claim is that the GCD of K and L is one. Indeed, if D is the GCD of K and L and that's bigger than one, then let's write K equals D times big K and L equals D times big L for some big K, big L integers. You know A is K plus L, which is D times big K plus big L. And you know B is K minus L, which is D times big K minus big L. And you also know that A and B aren't zero by the non-triviality of the solution ABC. So D properly divides A and B, but that contradicts the primitivity of the solution ABC. So the GCD of K and L is one. Okay, uh, the next thing we wanna see is that we can take K and L to actually be natural numbers, not just integers. First of all, note that A isn't plus or minus B for a couple of reasons. First of all, A and B are co-prime and neither A equals B equals one nor A equals negative B equals one yield non-trivial integer solutions to the Fermat equation. I'll let you check that. That's an easy first brute force check. But you could also see this by recalling that A and B are assumed to be positive. So of course this isn't true, okay? Now, you know 2K is A plus B and A plus B are natural. So K is positive. So what about L? Well, if L is negative, then since 2L is A minus B, you must have B is bigger than A. But then you could just simply swap the roles of A and B in our solution using the symmetry of the Fermat equation to produce a new non-trivial integer solution, BAC, still with positive entries and still with third entry even. And then note that under this new solution, our new quote unquote 2L is B minus A, which is now positive, okay? Because uh, A minus B was negative, okay? So we may assume that L is positive. So you get that K is just positive, and then by finagling with the solution, if need be, you can assume that L is positive without destroying any of the properties you've set up. Okay. We also need to check that K and L have different parities. That was part of the claim. Well, the GCD of K and L is one, so K and L cannot both be even. If K and L are both odd, then K minus L is even, but K minus L is B, and B is assumed to be odd, so that's a contradiction. Finally, we have to check that 2K times K squared plus 3L squared is a cube. That was the last thing claimed in claim one. But that's easy because C cubed is just A cubed plus B cubed, which factors as A plus B times A squared minus AB plus B squared. And if you substitute in our expressions for A and B in terms of K and L, you just get K plus L plus K minus L, 
times quantity k plus l squared minus k plus l times k minus l plus k minus l squared, which simplifies to 2k times k squared plus 3l squared. And so the claim is shown. This is a cube. It's actually c cubed. Okay, now this was all done under the assumption that c was even. If say a is even, which is really the same case as if b is even by the symmetry of the Fermat equation, you can reach almost the exact same conclusion in almost the same way. It's almost no different at all. I'll leave the details to you. Um, I'll give you references at the end of this video. Claim two, let k and l be the integers from claim one. Then the GCD of 2k and k squared plus 3l squared is one or three. Let's prove this. Assume there's a prime p such that p divides both numbers, 2k and k squared plus 3l squared. Since k and l have opposite parity, k squared plus 3l squared must be odd, and so p cannot be two. Let's assume that p is bigger than three. We'll get a contradiction. Let's find natural numbers m and n such that 2k is pm and k squared plus 3l squared is p big n. Since p isn't two, the first of these equations together with Euclid's lemma shows that two has to divide m because it either has to divide p or m because it's prime, but it can't be p because p is bigger than three, so it divides m. Okay, so two divides m. So we can write k is p times big M prime, where big M prime is n over two, which we know is a natural number because two divides m. But that means 3L squared is P big N minus K squared using this equation, which substituting in gives us PN minus P squared big M prime squared. Factoring a P out gives us P times big N minus P big M prime squared. So 3L squared is this. Okay, now P is bigger than three. And I have P dividing this product here. So P doesn't divide three. And by, so by Euclid's lemma, it divides L squared, hence L. But the problem is right now I have P dividing K. And then if P is bigger than three, P has to divide L, but P can't divide both K and L because K and L are co-prime. So that means any prime dividing two K and K squared plus three L squared must just be the prime three. This shows that if the GCD of two K and K squared plus three L squared is bigger than one, it must be a power of three. We would like to see that power of three is just three to the first. This, uh, this power of three can't be larger than three. Indeed, if three to the m for m at least two were such a common divisor, three would have to divide both k and l. I'll let you check that, that's an easy check. But again, that's impossible because the GCD of k and l is one. Okay, that proves the claim. The GCD of two k and k squared plus three l squared is either one or three. I'm going to be assuming from here on out for the rest of the proof that this GCD is actually one. You might wonder what happens if it's three, it turns out that's actually not a, a really a wrench in the plan at all. It's dealt with as a simple modification of the GCD1 case, and I'll give you references at the end. Okay, but it's not worth going through separately because it's so similar. In fact, it almost boils down to the GCD1 case. Okay, so we're going to assume this GCD here is one. If the GCD of 2K and K squared plus 3L squared is one, remember the product of these two numbers was a cube. And so because their GCD is one, 2K and K squared plus 3L squared must themselves be cubes. Okay, claim three, let K and L be the integers from claim one. And let's suppose that the GCD of 2K and K squared plus 3L squared is one. Then there exists co-prime integers, big K and big L of opposite parity, such that little K is big K cubed minus nine big K big L squared, and little L is three big K squared big L minus three big L cubed. It's at this point before I prove this claim that I should mention Euler's gap, which will be dealt with next video. Note that in general, if I, if I take an expression of the form alpha squared plus three beta squared times gamma squared plus three delta squared, that equals alpha gamma minus three beta delta all squared plus three times quantity alpha delta plus beta gamma all squared. So to find cubes of the form, let's say k squared plus three l squared, like the one we have above, consider the following calculation. Let's take alpha squared plus three beta squared cubed. Let's factor one of the alpha squared plus three beta squareds out. And let's write what's left as alpha squared minus three beta squared squared plus three times two alpha beta squared. That's just a simple calculation. Okay, now I'm gonna use this formula here applied to this setup. And I'm going to get that this equals quantity alpha times quantity alpha squared minus three beta squared minus three beta times two alpha beta all squared plus three times quantity alpha times two alpha beta plus beta times quantity alpha squared minus three beta squared all squared. Now you can just simplify this and it simplifies to alpha cubed minus nine alpha beta squared all squared plus three times quantity three alpha squared beta minus three beta cubed all squared. Why did I just run through all this messy algebra? This shows us something enlightening. 
one way to find cubes of the form k squared plus 3l squared is to choose alpha and beta to be random integers and to set k equals alpha cubed minus 9 alpha beta squared and l equals 3 alpha squared beta minus 3 beta cubed. In other words, choose this to be k, choose this to be l. Okay, now Euler's gap in his proof for exponent three was that he incorrectly proved the converse, which says that if k squared plus 3l squared is a cube, there have to be integers alpha and beta satisfying these two equations. Now, even though it was proven incorrectly, it turns out to be true, and we'll give a proof of that next video. So next video will be on filling in Euler's gap. For now, though, in this video, I'm going to take it for granted. So again, I'm taking for granted the fact that if k squared plus 3l squared is a cube, there are integers alpha and beta satisfying these two equations right here. Okay, those are going to be the integers big K and big L in the proof of claim three. So choose big K and big L integers such that K is big K cubed minus nine big K big L squared and L is three big K squared big L minus three big L cubed. We can do that by what we're assuming to be true. Okay, first we have to show big K and big L have opposite parities. If big K and big L are both odd, then K equals big K cubed minus nine big K big L squared is even. And L equals three big K squared big L minus three big L cubed is also even, but that's impossible because K and L are co-prime or also because they have opposite parities. If on the other hand, big K and big L are both even, then for the same reason, K and L are both even, but that's again impossible because K and L are co-prime. Okay, so big K and big L have opposite parities. Also, we had to check that big K and big L had GCD1. Um, that just follows from the fact that K and L have GCD1 using these two equations here. I'll let you check the details, it's easy. So I have found co-prime integers, big K and big L have opposite parities, such that K is big K cubed minus nine big K big L squared, and L is three big K squared big L minus three big L cubed. I'm also gonna just take note here that Big K and big L can't be zero because K and L are natural numbers, you see. So these equations prevent big K and big L from being zero. Okay, let's take this equation here for K and multiply both sides by two, giving me two K is two big K cubed minus 18 big K big L squared, which factors into two K, two big K times big K minus three big L times big K plus three big L. Claim four, let big K and big L be as in the previous claim. Then these three numbers are pairwise co-prime. So 2K, K, uh, 2 big K, big K minus 3 big L, and big K plus 3 big L are pairwise co-prime. Let's prove this. Now, big K and big L have opposite parities. So big K minus 3 big L and big K plus 3 big L are odd. Also note that 2 big K is definitely co-prime with big K plus or minus 3 big L. Okay. Indeed, if you have a prime P dividing two big K and say, for example, big K plus three big L, then P has to be odd since big K plus three big L is odd. Well, that means P not only divides two K, but because P is odd, it divides K and it divides big K plus three big L by assumption. So it divides three L divides their difference, but P can't divide big L because it divides big K and big K and big L are co-prime. Okay. Well, that means P has to be three, but if three divides big K, then three divides little K because little K is big K cubed minus nine big K big L squared, but that's impossible because little L is three big K squared big L minus three big L squared, which forces three to divide L, but three can't divide both K and L because K and L are co-prime, okay? So two K is co-prime with both K plus L and K minus three L. So why are K plus, uh, big K plus three big L and big K minus three big L co-prime? Well, let's go case by case. If an odd prime bigger than three divides both of them, it must divide big K because two big K is big K plus three big L plus big K minus three L, okay? And since the prime is bigger than three, it would have to divide two K, hence K. But it also has to divide big L because six big L is big K plus three big L minus quantity big K minus three L. So we're dividing both of these. So we're dividing six L, but we're a prime bigger than three. So we have to divide L, but that's impossible. You can't have a prime dividing big K and big L because they're co-prime. So primes bigger than three can't divide both of these. Uh, can't divide both of these, excuse me. But two can't divide both of these either because they're odd. <laughs> okay. 
The other thing, so why, what about the prime three? Why can't three divide both of these? Well, if it did, then three would divide big K because again, two big K is big K plus three big L plus big K minus three big L. Okay, so it would have to divide little k as well because little k is big k cubed minus nine big k big L squared. And it would also have to divide little l because l is three big k squared big L minus three big L squared, but that's impossible because little k and little l are co-prime. <laughs> okay, so how many times have we used that fact? Look, 20 now. Okay, so we're done. Two big k and big k plus or minus three big L are pairwise co-prime. I claim now we can prove for Moss Less Theorem for exponent three. I wanna make one little note here. The three numbers that we just got done showing are co-prime are also definitely not zero. So the numbers two big K and big K plus or minus three big L are non-zero because their product is two K and K is a natural number. Okay, onto the proof. The previous claim shows that because two K is two big K times big K minus three big L times big K plus three big L is a cube. Remember two K is a cube. All three of these guys themselves must be cubes because they're pairwise co-prime. Okay, so let's write two big K as C prime cubed, big K minus three big L as A prime cubed, and big K plus three big L as B prime cubed for some A prime, B prime, and C prime integers. Notice then that the triple A prime, B prime, C prime is a primitive. It's primitive by the previous claim. Non-trivial because the product of the cubes of these integers is 2K, which is positive integer solution to the Fermat equation of exponent three because a prime cubed plus b prime cubed is c prime cubed. Check that, so check all the details here, it's all easy. Okay, so what's the conclusion? Well, if c is even, note that 2k, which remember is a plus b, is a positive divisor of c cubed because that's a cubed plus b cubed, which is a plus b times a squared minus ab plus b squared. You can work it out. Um, I didn't do it above, but I didn't work out the A is even case, but you can check that if A is instead is even, for example, then 2K is a positive divisor of A cubed. You can just quickly reprove the first claim in the case A is even and mimic the case that C is even. And then similarly, if B is even, 2K will divide B cubed. Okay, so in any case, no matter what happens, the upshot is that 2K, which we know is A prime cubed, B prime cubed, C prime cubed, is strictly less than A cubed, B cubed, C cubed. Okay, that's what this shows. So check the strictness. Um, the strictness is very easy. It, it seems initially like we get less than or equal to here, um, but that's not the case as I'll let you check. Okay, now this product here, so A prime cubed, B prime cubed, C prime cubed is 2K, which is positive. So exactly two of, either all three of these numbers, A prime, B prime, C prime are positive, which is good, or exactly two of them are negative. But if this happens, if exactly two of them are negative, you can move those two associated negative cubes in the Fermat equation to the other side of the Fermat equation. And you end up with an equation of the form big A cubed plus big B cubed equals big C cubed, where A, B, and C are now pairwise co-prime positive integers. And of course, they still satisfy the property that big A cubed, big B cubed, big C cubed is strictly less than A cubed, B cubed, C cubed, basically because we're just taking negatives of certain you know, two of the three of A prime, B prime, and C prime. And this equation held up here, so this one will hold. Okay, so what's the point? Well, the point is I have a new non-trivial primitive integer solution to the Fermat equation of exponent three given by A prime, B prime, C prime, or big A, big B, C, B, if you like. And the product of the cubes of its entries is strictly less than the product of the cubes of the entries of the original solution ABC that I started with. So restart this procedure from the beginning with the new primitive integer solution, A prime, B prime, C prime, or big A, big B, big C if needed. And the point is you can't continue this on forever because doing so produces an infinite, strictly decreasing sequence of positive integers, the sequence of the A cube, B cube, C cube. And that leads to a contradiction by infinite descent. You can't have an infinite, strictly decreasing sequence of positive integers. All right, so, um, Next video, I will fill in Euler's gap, and then I will also give you the references that I promised. Um, just for now, though, a good place to read about some of the you know, little details I skipped and more about Fermat's Last Theorem for specific exponents would be Edward's book, Fermat's Last Theorem, A Genetic Introduction to Algebraic Number Theory, specifically the first few chapters. So I'll see you tomorrow to fill in Euler's gap. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you then.